Good morning, would you state your name and spell it for the record, please? My name is Ezra McCandless, um, E-M-E-Z-R-A-M-C-C-A-N-D-L-E-S-S. -S. Okay, Ezra, I'm gonna ask you to speak really clearly into the microphone because you're soft-spoken. Yes. Okay. So everybody can hear you, all right? All right. Um, I guess the first question I'm going to ask you is, why Ezra McCandless? Why that name? Why Ezra McCandless? Well, I have gone through a lot of changes in my life regarding identity and what really fits me. And I tried on a few names, but I found ultimately that Ezra fit perfectly for who I am. What was your birth name? My birth name was Monica J. And... Um, did your name eventually become the last name Carlin? Yes. Okay. So why did you decide specifically, I'm going to ask you the specifics of both names and what they mean to you. Let's talk about the last name first, why right. you changed your last name. I changed my last name, not to change my last name because of family's sake, but to I changed it because of the name McCandless is from an individual named Christopher McCandless from Into the Wild, he's known for. And his love for nature, his philosophies for life, they were very in tune and aligned with who I am. So I honored him by taking his last name. And what about... Um, and Into the Wild, just everybody might not know what it is, just in a sentence, tell us. It's a novel. It's a book he wrote. Okay. Uh, it was a book written about him? Yes, about him. Okay. And what about the name Ezra? How did you choose that name? I was on a family vacation, and it was just absolutely wonderful and I spotted the name Ezra and I noticed how it's it's more neutral it's it leans not necessarily masculine and it's not necessarily completely feminine and I found that just it felt right to me at a certain point in your life did you feel that being identified as female did not fit you yes Okay, why don't you explain how you view your gender? In high school, I found that I felt more comfortable being masculine. It was, it was how I identified at the time. Was my alignment was very masculine. What about now? Now I'm I'm fluid, so I I lean now more towards my femininity as a woman. Okay. And has this fluidity been going on for a period of time? Yes, for a few years now. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you what might seem like a silly question, but um, just some people knows. Have you been doodling in court? Yes. Can you I explain have. why? Well, I've been doodling in court because there's, there's times when this experience is very traumatic, and it helps center me so that... I can breathe through it and I can focus on something at the time so that I can breathe. Are you an artist? Yes. Can you just tell the jury a little bit about how you developed your interest in art? I developed my interest in art when I was as young as five years old. I've always had an interest in art and I've been doing it since then. And I continued to have a passion for it throughout high school and even in secondary school when I decided to take art and work for a professor of the arts and hang for a gallery. All right. Um, and the other thing I want to ask you is um, what you, your height and weight are. So what's your height, first of all? I'm 5'2". And how much do you weigh? I roughly... Or, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I roughly weigh 100, between 115 and 120 pounds. Back in March yes. of 2018, approximately, what was your weight? Or Approximately, my weight was 115. Wait, so about the same? Yes. Okay. 
Um, were there times before then where you were heavier? Yes. Okay. I'm going to ask you about meeting Alex. All right. Yes. Um, why don't you tell us how you met Alex Woodworth? I met Alex Woodworth one night when I noticed him. He was riding alone inside a bar called The Joint. He, he just seemed very focused, and I thought it was interesting that he was alone amongst all these people so focused on his writing. And when you saw him alone, focused on your, his writing, did you have any conversation with him? Yes. How did that occur? I was curious as to how he could focus alone, uh, alone on this topic. I approached him and I said, what are you writing about? Just tell me about it. Uh, I'm going to show you what has been marked as exhibit number 697. Six, sorry, can't see anything without my glasses. And ask you to identify what this is. This is a table of contents of Alex's writings. Okay. You've seen this before? Yes. All right. And just to understand what writings they are, you were in court when the original copies of his journal were shown. Yes. Right? And is this an accurate copy of them? Yes. All right. And just showing you, can you name the names of the journals? Yes. Do you want me to read? Yes, you can. You can. And it's just so the jury is clear, does this book contain both the original copies of the original handwriting and then typed copies to make it easier to read? Yes. All right. Okay. So what are the names of the journals? Personal Notes, Research Ideas, and the Quest to Understand. Okay. That's the first journal? Yes. The second? Extra Scraver. Okay. And the third? I met a man walking through a briar patch. He was looking for the rose promised by the thorns. Okay. Judge, I would move Exhibit 697 into evidence. Driver, can we just approach a second? Yes. All right, well, Exhibit 697, subject to uh, a limitation, um, will be received. When you met Mr. Woodworth. Yes. I'm going to show you page 6. First of all, on that day, did Alex Woodworth show you his journal? Yes. And looking at page six, I'm just going to ask you to take a minute to look. There's two pages to page six, a typed version and a handwritten version. Yes. Are those the same, the typed version and the handwritten version? Yes, they are. Did he share with you what he had written on that day. Yes, he did share with me. Did you also read it at a later date? Yes. All right, I'm going to put this on the... Oh, my. And just to clarify the record, this is a journal entry from August 8th, 2017, right? Okay. So just to show what the handwritten version looks like, is this the handwritten version? Yes. All right. Now so we can read it, I'm going to show you the typed version. Huh? Okay. So in this typed version... After, it starts with a quotation, right? Yes. And that's yes. from a book? Yes. Do you know who the author of that book is? No, I cannot remember. Okay, that's fine. Can you read the next sentence to the jury? 
I am oddly preoccupi preoccupied with the concept of can cannibalism, not quite with the actual can cannibalism practice, but rather the indwelling metaphors our understanding actually works with. All right. The essay, do, what does the essay go on to talk about without having to read every line? Cannibalism is mentioned in this essay a few times. It goes on to deal with the concept of metaphorical cannibalism and the concept of cannibalism itself as what cannibalism renders you as and the anxieties and the fears and being a meal in a sense. Is it fair to say, or is your interpretation of the essay that it is philosophical in nature? Yes. As opposed to literal in nature? Yes. I'll come back to his writings on cannibalism, but I'm going to uh, ask you a little more about that conversation <coughs> with him. Yes. Aside from looking at his journal about cannibalism, what discussions did you and Alex Woodworth have at that time? Well, I was, he caught me right away because I thought it was quite a peculiar subject, cannibalism. And I was interested in what he meant, what I understood. He was speaking of it philosophically, and I also wanted his ideas and his concepts of literally cannibalism. So we talked back and forth about a few artists that have partaken in cannibalism that he mentioned. We spoke about his, the anxieties of and what it means for someone to consume another. What did he say that at that time, on August 8th, or roughly August 8th of 2017, what did he tell you about what he meant by consuming another? Objection at hearsay, Your Honor. Uh, overruled. Thank you. Uh, again, we have had a pre-trial ruling on this, and it, it doesn't go to the truth of the matter. It only goes to what Ms. McCandless heard or understood or what was in her mind. So you may proceed. As long as we're on that understanding, then that's fine. Okay. I withdraw the objection. Can you ask the question again, please? Sure. Uh, actually, I'll have the court reporter read it back, so it's exactly the same. Okay. Okay, so what did he say at that time on August 8th, or roughly August 8th of 2017? What did he tell you about... Oh, what did he tell you about what he meant by consuming others? Thank you. At that time, when we were deep in this discussion, he was, we talked about, he mostly talked about the philosophical sense, and he also mentioned the fact that often individuals partook in cannibalism because it was, in essence, a consumption of one's power to take in another's flesh. All right. Besides cannibalism, did you talk about other things with him that evening? Yes. All right. At some point, was your conversation interrupted by another person? It was. Who came over to interrupt your conversation? My boyfriend at the time, Jason, pulled me aside, and he kind of interrupted our conversation. Um, what impressions or feelings did you have after Jason interrupted your conversation? Can you, about him interrupting? Yes, about him interrupting. Well, I was, I felt that, that my conversation was cut short, that I had plenty more to talk about. Did you, were you able to then continue your conversation with Alex Woodworth? Yes. Um, why don't you just summarize that for us? What else you talked about? Well, we went out for a smoke and we started talking about our love for spiders because we both noticed a spider in the window sill or the a spider web. We noticed it at the same time. Okay. Um, so that first time that you talked to Alex, um, how long? About, if you can remember approximately, how long do you think your conversation was with him on that particular date? 
In whole, I think our conversation was about an hour. Did um, you uh, continue your friendship after that? Yes. And um, did you eventually become more than just friends? Yes. All right. We're going to return to that. But right, right now, I'm going to get into a different topic with you, all right? I'm going to ask you about Jason Mangle. All right. Um, tell us briefly how you met Jason. I met Jason outside of a coffee shop one night after a music festival. What's the name of that coffee shop? Racy Delanes. All right. Um, and just tell us a little bit about meeting him. He let out a big sigh, and I was curious why he was doing that. He seemed quite frustrated, so I said, well, what's the matter? And we just, we instantly started talking, and we talked almost all night. After that all-night conversation, what happened with you and Jason? Well, after we exchanged information, we had begun texting and back and forth, and we started seeing each other after. At that time, where were you living? I was living with my mother in Stanley, Wisconsin. The texting went on, and did it texting lead to dating? Yes. You sound kind of happy about that, or <laughs> not happy, intense, I would say, would well, be the word. We fell in love quite fast because we had just so much in common. And how, in the beginning of that relationship, how would you characterize how Jason treated you? He treated me very well. What was the age difference, or what is the age difference between you and Jason Mangle? It's about 13, 14 years apart. Do you know how old you were when you met him? Yes, I was about 19. Did you know how old he was? Yes. How old was he then? If you recall. He was about 34. All right. So that's how you remember it? Yeah. All right. So there's yes. about a 15 or so year age difference between the two of you? Yes. How, did you realize that right away when you met him? Yes. How did you feel about that? That well, age difference specifically? The age difference? Well, I wasn't concerned necessarily that we had an age gap. I felt a bit awkward that he was so much older than me and he was even close to my own parents' age. Did there come a time in your relationship where you got pregnant? Yes. How did you discover that? I was very sick and I had been throwing up for weeks and I decided to go buy a pregnancy test and take it. Uh, when you say buy a pregnancy test, do you mean those kinds they sell in the drugstore that give you a line? Yes. All right. So where were you when you took the pregnancy test? Do you remember? I was at a gas station. And did you tell Jason about it? Yes, I did. How did he react? He, he seemed anxious and he wanted to go to get it, he wanted to go get the test confirmed at the doctors and he was it was hard to really read what he was thinking at the time did you go to the doctor yes i did after um uh, and what was the result from the doctor's office i was in fact pregnant ultimately uh what did you decide to do about that pregnancy I ultimately decided to terminate the pregnancy early on. Why? I, was, I wasn't sure what to do at that time. I was scared. I was so young. I was confused as to really what to do. So I decided, it, was, it felt rushed, I decided to terminate the pregnancy. And um, would it be fair to say that even then you had very conflicted feelings? Yes. Objection leading. Sustained. Hi. Um, how did terminating the pregnancy make you feel? I felt very empty after. I felt very, it hurt emotionally and physically, and it made me feel 
alone and very empty. After terminating the pregnancy, um, did you tell Jason you did not want him in the room? I did, yes. Why? I felt overwhelmingly ashamed and I just felt like I didn't want to have him witness me in, like that. I didn't, I didn't want him to. This abortion and its aftermath, you, was there a change at all to your relationship? Yes. Why don't you tell us about that? After the abortion, things between me and my partner, Jason, it caused a lot of distance between us. He began sleeping on the couch and he rejected physical intimacy, even holding my hand at times. Just so we set the date, do you recall the date that you terminated your pregnancy? Yes. When was it? The only date that I could schedule was October 6th. Is that a significant day to you in another way? Yes. Why? It's my birthday. So you said he started sleeping on the couch. <coughs> yes. Um, lacked physical intimacy, wouldn't even hold your hand. Were there other things going on in your relationship that made you feel uneasy or unhappy? Yes. Why don't you tell us about those? Jason and I started feeling frustrated, and I felt very micromanaged at the time. He, he, want, he was controlling me in many ways and micromanaging me, and we, we had just, we had started to grow apart as a couple. Were there anything that he did that made you feel physically uncomfortable? Yes, he, he never hit me, but he would be very erratic with his gestures, and sometimes he would throw things or break things, and it just, that made me uneasy. Um, did he make accusations of you at all? Yes. Why don't you give us an example? An example of an accusation is that I was clumsy and that I would lose his things all of the time. And there was a time where he got very heated over a Sharpie marker even, and it caused an argument between us. What did he say about the Sharpie marker? That I misplaced it on purpose, and I just, I'm so stupid for losing things all the time. I shouldn't touch his things. That, that's about what it was about. You were in court when Jenna Van de Zant testified? Yes. And um, she identified herself as, well, first of all, did Jason have a roommate back at that time? Yes, he did. What was that roommate's name? His name was Alexander, Z Alexander Zink. And what was Jenna Van de Zandt's relationship to Alexander Zink? They were boyfriend and girlfriend. Uh, was she somebody that at that time you became close to? Yes. You heard her testify about Jason um, criticizing your makeup, or uh, what was that about? Well, he would at times criticize my makeup. He would say I looked like a clown, or he would criticize my weight, even though at that time I was very small from being sick. And he just, anything he could really pick at, he would. Um, you mentioned that Jason and your adoptive father, Joe Shane Carlin, are about the same age. Yes. And, um... Did Jason have a relationship? Um, well, first, did Jason in some ways remind you of your father? Oh, yes. He definitely reminded me of my father. Okay. Can it, it, Currently, how's your relationship with your father? I love him, and we're fine. Okay. But growing up, how was your relationship with your father? It was very turbulent. I was often afraid of him and intimidated and very put down. Um, well, first of all, let me ask about both your parents, your mother and your father. When you grew up, yes. at a certain point, did your mother and Joe Shane get a divorce? Yes. How old were you then? I was in middle school, so 11, 12... 
before the divorce, what word would you say most describe that household? It was like living with two, two tornadoes in one room. All right. And focusing on that, um, yes. the tornado that was Joe Shane, when you say tornadoes, what do you mean by that? What I mean by that, that is they're both very strong, opinionated people, and they just would often butt heads. And my mom had, she disagreed about ways he would discipline me, and that would cause arguments. Was there a lot of time when your mom was not at home during that period of your life? Yes, she was working. And when you were with Joe Shane and your mother wasn't around? Yes. Tell us about some of the things he would do. Some of the things he would do when I was younger is he often, he was, he was very loud. He would always yell about something or he would put me down. He often called me stupid and he just, he would say I wouldn't amount to much and that I was slow and he just, he was very emotionally abusive to me. Um, how did you respond to that? I responded by just being quiet and I would cry and I would just often go off and be alone. When you would cry, how would he handle that? He doesn't approve of crying. He would tell me that he would give me something to cry about. Was part of your response of dealing with him, um, did you sometimes feel like you were like spaced out or lost a sense of where you were? Yes. Why don't you tell us about that? There was often times to tone out the yelling and the name calling that I felt very distant from myself. I would essentially just close off everything around me and I didn't want to cry in front of him. So I would, in that, I would prevent myself from crying. Um, were there times where you found yourself in that state without even realizing you were going there? Yes, there was times I would zone out and I wouldn't even realize I was doing it at the time. All right. Um, and getting back to Jason. Yes. Um, did he meet your parents? Yes. And Jason and your father, what kind of relationship did they have? Very buddy-buddy. They are very close with each other. Okay. So coming back to the issue, leaving aside your family. Yes. Coming back to the issue of you and Jason, and you're in this period where things aren't going well. Yes. What is happening at this point in your friendship with Alex Woodworth? And, and I'm directing you specifically to October yes. of 2017, okay? After the abortion. Alex okay. and I, we began, he would notice me at the coffee shop and I would notice him more. And we started going on long walks with each other after he would close. When you say he would close, what do you mean? He, closing up the restaurant, coffee shop, Racy Delane's. Do you mean he was closing up because he was the last patron there, or was he working there? Working. And on these walks, um, why don't you tell us what you and Alex talked about? Alex and I, we talked about life itself. I would talk about nature and how I viewed things, and then... Alex would talk about how he would view things and his philosophies and his ramblings, as he would say. And often I was kind of the yin to his yang because a lot of his philosophies countered mine because mine are very in the sunlight, in the sunshine, and his are very much so a rainy day. Um. Did you tell Alex about your abortion? Yes, I did. I, on one of our walks, I shared with him what I was going through at that time. And he allowed me to open up about it and how I really truly felt and all of the pain that came with it. As you got close to Alex. Yes. Did you learn more about his past? I, I learned some things about his past, yes. And 
your relationship, I'm going to ask you some questions about his past, actually. All right. What did you learn about Alex and his feelings as you became close with him? Feelings towards his past? Yeah, just tell us some of the things he shared with you. Some of the things he shared with me is that he often puts a happy face on when he goes back home for holidays, and at times it can deeply depress him, and he often felt like an outsider, that he had arguments with his father, I believe, and that he was deeply I religious. I guess I'm going to object, Your Honor. I don't see, I don't see the relevance, number one. And number two, uh, it's hearsay. Well, I, I, again, the, first of all, in the hearsay objection, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and you're going to hear testimony about things that Mr. Woodworth may have said and things that he may have wrote. And they're allowed in this case not for the truth of what he wrote or what he said, and this is, this is a difficult concept, I think. And you'll get an instruction at the close of the case and how, why this evidence is uh, admitted and why it is allowed. Um, and uh, so, it, again, it's, and lawyers understand this, and hear it all the time, but it's not offered for the truth of the matter asserted, but only offered as it goes to the context uh, and, and, and the state of mind Miss McCandless may have had and how that what she heard or read affected her and so um, now the second issue um, what I guess can we approach her on? yeah okay All right. ladies and gentlemen uh, the objection is sustained on, on relevance um, and so Miss Vishnu will continue all right I want to ask you some questions about Alex and his feelings um, all right. All right. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you an essay. <coughs> that you okay. I'm showing you again from Exhibit 697 an uh, essay called Words, dated November 6, 26, excuse me, 2016. Yes. All right. So. Again, looking at the typed and the handwritten pages, have you had an ability to look at them before and compare them? Yes. And are they, is the typed version just make it easier to read? Yes. Okay. Um, now this essay was written before Alex met you, but have you read this essay? Yes, I have. And have you discussed it with Alex? Yes. Is this the typed version of the essay called Words? Yes. All right. Looking at the second paragraph of that essay, can you read the second paragraph? Are you speaking of the paragraph that starts with yet? No, this paragraph that starts with do I wish. Do right we... on the top. So I've. All right, would you like me to read this? Yes, please. Do I wish, desire, to die? In a way, yes, in another, no. For the first, life is misery, each day the same, exhausting. For the second, a wager of experiences that outweigh any present pain. The former is inexplicable. The latter is need of comment. Okay, the next paragraph. There is little I've enjoyed more than the physical intimacy. The contact under covers list watching a film, for example. These have a way of grounding a shattered conscience. Regardless of any euphoria of reflection, her presence, her breath against me, the heaves of her chest cement me, pull me back together. Indeed, bliss is her heart beat felt. All right, now Fair to say those words are not written about you. This journal is written before he met you. Yes. Did he express uh, similar feelings towards you uh, eventually in your relationship? Definitely. Objection relevance. Uh, I'm an overrule. Go ahead. Yes, he did. All right. And does he continue 
in this essay to talk about depression? Yes. What does he say at the top of this page, starting with the word or? Or, in formula, my emptiness is what prevents any feel fulfillment. Or again, my misery blocks any happiness from occurring. Yet again, my illness makes a cure unattainable. And, How, okay, go ahead. You can How go. sad, huh? Does he talk in this essay about philosophy and how that helps him? Yes. What does he say about that? You can just summarize it if you remember it. Philosophy is kind of a vessel for him. And by a vessel, what do you mean? A vessel for is what I considered pain. Okay. Does Did he say that philosophy was like a way out or something that he yes. could escape into? And at the very end, in his essay, after he talks about escaping into it, what does he say? He says... And so, starting with those words. And so... Do you mean pity me? No, the paragraph before that. All right. And so, my attempt to escape is futile. I am trapped by the very trapped I was caught by, the longing to be otherwise that alone. Yet, that is what I am, alone. My loneliness even prevents socialization. Too many times I have heard, you didn't look like you wanted to talk, entirely because I longed for that very connection I failed to even be recognized as feeling alone because of how alone I fell. Pity me, I refuse to utter such words. Instead, my only hope is to be as alone as I feel, so I can. Thank you. Were there other times that Alex Woodworth wrote about being lonely, empty, and misery? Did that theme continue in his writings? It continued, yes. Okay. Um, this first before I get to the themes of loneliness and misery in his writing yes did your relationship eventually change from being friends and confidants who went on walks and discussed philosophy into something else yes why don't you tell us about that Alex and I it started slow. We we held hands, we hugged, and we shared a few kisses, and then eventually we became partners. And was this? Were you still living with Jason during this time? Yes. Um, when you say you became partners, can you just explain what kind of partner you mean? S sexual partners. Okay. Um, and did he express desires for you to be vulnerable to him? Absolutely, yes. I'm going to show you another uh, essay of his. I'm just waiting to get it out of the book. Yes. Okay. title of this essay? In quotes it says, come as you are, flaws and all. What's the date that this essay was written? October 29th, 2017. And again, is the type version the same as the handwritten version? Yes.
first of all, looking at the very top of this essay, Come As You Are. Yes. Okay. I just want to ask you, without having you read the whole top, you notice that he talks about Caputo, Abraham, and God. And, yes. And the Abrahamic story of Isaac and sacrifice. Is that what that relates to? Yes, it does. Okay. And was Caputo... Um, or, or just tell tell us about Alex and Caputo or that that book. Was that a book he was fond of? He was very fond of that book. It was a staple in his reading and his philosophies. Okay. Um, does he also in this the last sentence in this paragraph mentions? If I'll, I'll just read it for you. Alongside the obligatory, I want to find a poetics of erotics. Did he connect Caputo philosophy? And eroticism? Yes. Objection, leading. I don't think that's leading. I just asked if he connected them. It's a preliminary I'm, question. Okay, I'll give you a little latitude, so I'm going to overrule. You. But okay. it, is, it is leading. What, what do you mean by that when you say he connected those things? What I mean by that is that he wanted to explore them in his concepts of erotics. He wanted to explore the stories from Caputo and the novel about Abraham. Okay. And going to he, later down the page, all right, as yes. it continues, I'm going to ask you specifically, and I'm trying to make this easier for you to read than, so you don't have to search. Thank you. Okay. Can you read that paragraph that starts with, Here I am. Here I am. Come as you are, flaws and all. I wager myself and invite you to risk yourself. All right, just stop right there. Do you know what he's writing about in this essay on October 29th? Yes, I do. How do you know? I know because come as you are, flaws and all was a discussion we had between each other often. It was something he would say to me, he would text to me and ask of me all of the time. Okay, and go ahead and keep reading that. All, I, all of this is needed. I cannot command you to come unless I risk the same. In this phrase, I occupy both the Abrahamic, here I am, and the divine, come. If either parts fails, erotics fails, even if it succeeds. All right, keep going. If I do not risk myself, I reveal the desire to possess. I am seducing, not loving. If I do not invite you to risk yourself, I become the ethical fool, the willing sacrifice. I am committed, but to someone who doesn't love me. What's he talking about there, committed, but to someone who doesn't love him? Objection, sustained for speculation. Did he discuss with you what that line meant, that he's committed, but to somebody who doesn't love me? Yes, we had this discussion, as we did in many of our discussions, about that I was still in a relationship, essentially, with Jason. So he felt that because I was still in that relationship, I was not fully committed to just him. This essay ends with him saying, we hide our flaws, and it is a feat to come flaws and all. Have you actually responded? Do you know what he's referring to there? Yes. Okay. Can you tell the jury that? What he is saying there is that it's hard to bear yourself to someone completely, to be vulnerable. Do I... You, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Sorry. I was out... He asked me to be vulnerable with him, to essentially come to him, flaws and all. And I've often struggled bearing my flaws easily and openly. So it was this discussion in this essay we read together was about how I was and trying to bear myself to him and as he was asking because he bared himself to me that I should do the same. Now let's talk a little bit more about your relationship and its development. So this is written in late October. Yes. 
in that time in October, just what's the status of your relationship with him yet? Is it sexual? Is it on its way to being sexual? What's going on? It's at that time we were becoming intimate. Yes, we were very much so falling in love at that time. And, um, did there come a time where you spent the night at his house? Yes. Do you remember roughly when that first time was? E roughly, yes, I do remember. Okay, why don't you tell us? It was late October. Could it have November. been the beginning of October? Oh, uh, yes. I I'm sorry, not late October. Could it be beginning of November? That's what I meant to say. Yes. I'm getting a little confused. All right. And um, was Jason out of town when that happened? Yes, he was. Okay. Um, you've seen Alex's roommates come in and testify, his yes. former roommates? Yes. All right. Um, was Dave Stoiding a roommate at that time? Yes, he was. Had you ever met him? No. Or we kind of avoided each other. Okay. And what about the other roommate, Matt Schreiner? Did he eventually become a roommate too? Or was he, he, was a roommate? A, he was a roommate at the time, yes. And did you socialize with him at all? Off and on, we had socialized. We met each other at the coffee shop a few times. Okay. Um, so when you um, stayed over with him, tell us how your relationship was developing at that time. At that time, it was becoming very intimate, is how I can describe it. We have be we at that time had become sexual partners, and we were sharing with each other a lot of ourselves. D despite the fact that you were close and sharing things, yes. was Alex still writing in a way that reflected and talking to you in a way that reflected misery or depression or unhappiness? Or Yes, he was. I'm showing you an essay in Exhibit 697 yes. called The Failure to Write, dated December 21st. 2017. Yes. Are you familiar with that essay? Yes. And is it the same as the handwritten? Is the type version the same as the handwritten? Yes. Now, in this essay, without reading, can you tell us, or, or just, I mean, not reading the whole thing, the paragraph that says, this is supposed to help my misery. Can you, can you read that paragraph? Yes. This is supposed to help ease my misery, but it only draws it into reflection. I want to say so much to you, but I cannot bring myself to speak. The words, if said to you, would only hurt more. They would hurt you and exacerbate, exacerbate my own pain. Is that exacerbate? Exacerbate. That, that's okay. Then the words that he says after that, he goes on. Can you read that? I know that I am not your priority. I am secondary to you. I believe that you love me, but your love for another is what you place your faith in. I am loved, but in a way that you can always give up. You believe that things can get better with the love you prioritize, and that means you believe you will abandon me someday. I am in so much pain because you love me, and, y and still you hope to abandon me to my loneliness again. Can you see that your desire for your priority is also a desire for my annihilation? Can I show you this? Or is my only hope to be that your priority ceases to be so far the development of my own significance? Can you realize that I am your significant other in a way that I benefit from? Now, this essay was written on December 21st, 2017. Yes. Okay, we're going to come back in a little bit to something that happened in December of 2017. Actually, I'm going to show you another essay. This is from December 26th, 2017. <coughs> Yes. What is the title of that essay? An Obsession with Misery, December 26, 2017. Okay. And um, is this the typed version again? Is it the same as the handwritten? Yes.
Okay, this is short. Yes. Okay, why don't you read this? All right. Alongside my obsession with erotics, I am possessed to write about misery, the failing of happy consciousness. In all honesty, suffering is among my greatest interests. Okay, I'm gonna... Okay, just go ahead. Keep going. I am in love with the feminology of illness, both mental and physical, but also with the sub-pathological suffering. The plight of a guilty woman who is sexually promiscuous interests me as much as those with cancer, depression, and dysphoria. The anxiety of perfectionism, of a short prognosis of lifelong uncurable symptoms, is a game, as that is an overworked college student with a cumulative final, each differs from the others, but that there is misery remains constant. Love has been interwoven into my life, but so has object misery been. I recall my first okay. love. I, I'm going to stop you okay. there because um, he is talking. Did he discuss this essay with you? Yes. And he goes on in the essay to talk about other people and their misery? Yes, he does. All right. And do you know, or did he talk to you about why he was writing about misery at near the end of December? He was himself feeling a lot of internal pain and loneliness, even well as we had a relationship together. So let me ask you, when you first met him, we, we talked about this a little earlier. Yes. And... He was writing about cannibalism, right? Yes, he was. All right. Do you recall, did that theme continue in his discussions with you? Often, yes. And did he write about that in some of his other essays? Yes. Um, this is an essay going back to August of 2017. What's the name of this essay? Dead to Me. And the date? August 6, 2017. Is the type version the same as the handwritten? Yes. And looking at... I'll get this up to the right place one minute. To say I'm not great at using this Elmo. This essay, can you just read the first sentence of that paragraph? Yes. Because you are dead to me, this love fails to truly be fails to be truly erotic now, though it may have been. Instead, we are speaking of cannibalism. All right. So <coughs> besides cannibalism in his writings, aside from that, this is in August, we've already talked about it. Yes. Did he continue to have these discussions with you about cannibalism beyond writing about them? All of the time, yes. What, what would he, did, did his expressions or his talks about cannibalism go beyond the esoteric or the philosoph philosophical in, from what you heard from him? Yes. Why don't you tell us about that? It would it went beyond philosophy at points when we would discuss erotics of cannibalism and cannibalism in the sense of individuals in history and through the past and even artists who have take, partaken in cannibalism because of their ultimate de desire to consume that individual, to consume that individual's power or to consume that individual so that that person they had loved would never leave them. So, in other words, I, I'm not quite understanding what you mean, the person that they loved would never leave them. Could you just explain a little bit more what, what yes. Alex told you and what he meant about that? We specifically spoke of individuals, lovers, that partook in cannibalism, and he consumed his partner so that, in essence, by consuming his partner, eating him, because he was passed away, he was never away from him. He had absorbed his essence. What is the title of this essay? 
violation. And the date? August 9th, 2017. So, again, is he writing about you in this essay? No. Okay. So, I'm going to show you just a brief part of this essay. In this essay, is he discussing a prior relationship with him? Yes. All right. Can you read this where it says distract me? Yes. Distract me is dehumanize, dehumanizing, unhuman. It is the request of a mind to flesh. It is cannibalism. The words haunt me, confirming that you had died to me. I was lift with a revenant. A fa facsimile? facsimile? A facsimile of a person who spoke of a warm caress while offering a vampire touch. Now, in that essay, when he said, I was lift with a remnant, first of all, in your discussions with him, was lift actually intended to be left? I was left with a remnant? Yes. Okay, that's what I'm asking about. All right. And in that discussion can you explain what a revenant or, or not what it is necessarily but what alex said a revenant was yes we often talked about a revenant when we would speak of a revenant or a revenant we would discuss how it, essentially what a revenant is is an individual come back from the dead a specter or a ghost of sorts they have come back to do unfinished business or it is called like retribution or it's unfinished business essentially is what a revenant comes back for it was a topic we often talked about because he would tell me he considered himself a revenant and again from exhibit 697 i'm showing you an, another essay Yes. And can you tell the jury what the title, why don't you tell me what the title is here of this essay and the date? From the Past, Memories, November 2017, reworked from July 24th, 2017. Again, is the typed the same as the handwritten? Yes. I'm going to ask you to read it from where it says, I know now. It Just the next few sentences. I know now that you wanted to change me and be changed by me. You asked for my flesh. I'm sorry, I had that little. Thank you. You asked for my flesh and offered me yours, both, but so that we could give and receive back new flesh. I am yours, become mine. I mistook the innocent play, your desire for my hunger. I saw cannibalism where you asked to be seen erotically. Okay, let's stop there. When he says, I saw cannibalism, when he's, you asked to be seen erotically, do you know what he's writing about? Objection calls for speculation. Sustain. Did you discuss with Alex what he was writing about? Yes. Why don't you tell us what that was about? When I discussed this with Alex, he was speaking of, he was taking the other person in, he was consuming them wholly were they seen where they wanted to be seen erotically lovingly he was seeing them as something to take in to possess did alex tell you whether or not that reference was about you yes and what did he say he told me that it was in reference of me because of parallels of someone he was with in the past I'm going to show you again the beginning of the same essay. Yes. Um, let me get it to this. Can you read this? I am warm. I am kind. I am good. When did, it, when did I become so dull inside? I am not warm. I am so gloomy. I am not kind. I am so distant. I'm not good. I'm aberrant. I've aberrant, got, is that aberrant? Aberrant. Okay. I've gotten too good at being these things. Am I seen as a good, as a person anymore? They aren't masks, though. All right, let me ask you about there where he's saying he's aberrant and it's not a mask. Can you explain, or did you, Alex discuss with you what he meant by that? 
He discussed with me about masks often. One minute, please. All right, and can you tell me what he would tell you about masks? Or not tell me, tell all of us. Yes. What he told me about masks is that he often seen others and he often felt himself that he had to put on a mask to present himself a certain way so that when he was out in public or when he was at work, he would put on a certain face. And often he felt that it was always hard to always have to wear a mask with certain people. All right, in the same essay, yes. I'm gonna go to one more area, all right? And I'll direct you over to the words my touch. Can you see that? Yes, I can. Okay, why don't you read that? My touch is a request. Feel nothing but me. Let me give death a face to you. Has my body ever taken someone's from there and gave it back different? I remember holding her with my coat, warming her already too human face. Did it consume her as she did me? Or was my futile attempt to possess but kindling? I am not warm, but I can offer myself to your blaze. Okay, I'll ask you to stop there. Again, did Alex discuss with you what he meant? And I want to ask specifically about where he says, let me give death a face to you. Do you did he talk about that with you? He did talk about that with me. And what did he mean? He wasn't... He wasn't talking about death as in looking at the other individual and he's seen death. He was, in essence, speaking of how loving that individual was as death. It is, it's, it's a hard thing to just outright and say. Okay. Um... I want to ask you about the sexual aspects of your relationship with Alex during this time, meaning late October, November, December, all, all right. right? So during this period of time, can you tell us some of the, and um, I know it's very intimate, but some of the it details is. of your sexuality or the sexuality or sex between you and Alex Woodworth? Alex and I, when we began our relationship, sex was very vanilla, I can say. It what was, does vanilla mean? Well, Just in case people haven't heard that expression. What vanilla means is that it was your, your average sex, it was missionary, your, your what a lot of people would describe as normal sex. Okay, and during this period of time, were, was there some progression from the pure vanilla into yes. some differences early now, November, December? Yes, there were. I encouraged him to explore himself and things he might want. And he started, we started practicing and doing these new things that he wanted to express himself. Okay. First of all, in terms of sexual position, was there a preferred sexual position from Alex's that Alex told you he preferred? Yes. What was that? It was called prone, as he informed me. And were you face to face during sex? No, rarely. Okay. What position were you in? From behind is what you can call it. He would often express this desire for it. And were there objects he would use uh, that impaired your sight at all? Yes, he, he preferred to have my glasses off and he enjoyed to blindfold me. Um, was there uh, anything specific about lightness versus darkness? Yes, he he liked it to be either soft light, a candle, or he preferred it to be absolutely dark. 
he enjoyed kind of the mystery of it all in the dark. How did you feel about that? I thought it was interesting and exciting, and I also felt I am very visually impaired without my glasses, so I get a little uncomfortable at times without them. Let me ask this. Did Alex refer to you as a boy? Yes. Do you know why he referred you to you as a boy? Did he tell you why? Yes. Can you tell us about that? Objection relevance. <coughs> I'm going to rule. Go ahead. Again, we, we, there's a limited purpose. For, yes, this is for her feelings. Okay. Yeah, I, I think this has been out there quite a bit already in front of All the right. jury. All right, what were your feelings, or, or what did he tell you about him referring to you as a boy? Well, as our relationship progressed, um, I told him about how I identified in the past as almost strictly masculine. And he, he preferred that I presented myself in a masculine way. He often told me how confident I looked and how much he was attracted to me because he could call me a boy, his boy, and present that way. Did you present yourself as a male to Alex? Yes, I did. What about the word boy specifically? How did you feel about his use of the word boy? The word boy specifically, at first it was gender, as you can call it, but then the word became more possessive. I was his boy. It felt objectifying at times. And what do you mean by objectifying? I felt as if I was an object, that I was not Ezra McCandless, essentially, but I was just his boy. Um, Judge, I need a break. I'm sorry. I would like to take a short break. I, I need to take a short break, please. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a 10-minute recess, and uh, so we'll excuse you for that. Um, all rise. Um, Ms. McCandless, you have referred to some essays from a book called Personal Notes and Research Ideas of the Quest to Understand. Correct? Yes. And um, I inadvertently, I didn't realize that the original was not in evidence, so I'm showing you what's been marked. Oops, is it Exhibit 698? Uh, yes. Is that the orange notebook that contains those essays you've testified about? Yes. Thank no you. No objection to its admission, Your Honor. All right. And what's that, Exhibit 698? Yes. Okay. Exhibit 698 will be received, again, subject to uh, court's pretrial rulings. Now, I've also been showing you what was previously marked as number, I believe, 653. I just want to make sure. And this is a copy of the <coughs> book, the original of the book, called Extra Scriber. Yes. I'm going to ask you to please turn to page 32 in this book. Or maybe I'll do it for you just to make it. Mm -hmm. So first of all, are there page numbers at the bottom of each page? Yes. All right. Um, on page 32, do you see a doodle at the bottom of that page? Yes. What is that doodle? Sorry. Um, this doodle is a dog. Okay. Who drew it? I did. Do you remember when you drew it? <laughs> yes. Can you tell the jury when you drew it? I drew it when we were together sharing a cup of coffee and he was writing and I was reading as he was writing. All right. And then turning to page 41 in the journal, is there a doodle at the bottom of page 41? Yes. And when did you doodle that? I doodled this when we were together yet again and it's a bug of sorts. All right. And then turning to page 181. <coughs> 
At the bottom of page 181, is there another doodle? Yes, there is. And when did you doodle that? I doodled this yet again when we were spending time together and he was explaining to me and we were talking back and forth about this essay. Okay, thank you. I don't have any further questions about your doodles. Thank you. An extra scriber. I'm showing you much of the art as exhibit 651. Is this another journal of yes. Alex Woodworth? Yes. And just, just what's the name of that journal? This journal, it's notes, October 19th, 2017 through Dream Tea, Tree, Simple and Elegant. And turning to the first page, is there a doodle at the bottom of that page? Yes. Did you draw that? Yes. Do it's you remember when you drew it? Yes, I remember when he asked me to read this and I drew a pumpkin with some hearts. Uh, uh, page 25. Is there a doodle on page 25? Yes, a cat. All right, page 27. Is there a doodle on page 27? Yes, a doodle of a peach. Page 32. Yes, this is a fox. And page 35? Yes, there's a doodle. All right, and were all of those doodles drawn when you were with Alex Woodworth at times he was talking about the pages on the journal? Yes. I'm going to show you what was previously marked as exhibit number 654. Oh, the Amazona. Okay. I'm going to show you this book. Let me try and get the whole book in. Oops. Bearing in mind that I'm not great at this. Okay. Okay, I've been showing you what's been previously been marked, I think, as exhibit number 654. Yes. Um, what is this? This is Soren Kierkegaard, Fear and Trembling. Um, this particular book, did Alex discuss this book with you much? We discussed it often, and we discussed it the most during very intimate moments of our relationship. I want you to explain to the jury what you mean by him discussing them during intimate moments in your relationship. This book was the book he would read from as we were having sex, and he would read passages from this book. Was there another book he also read passages from when you were engaged in sex with Alex? Yes, he would read from Caputo. Hope. Do, do you know what the name of that book is? Hoping Against Hope. We were talking about Alex referring to you as boy a little bit earlier. Yes. Did he also write about that in his journals? He did, yes. And I'm going to show you an essay from his journals. That's one minute. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get the right part. All right. I think we were talking about boy, and I'm going to show you a journal entry and ask you what the name of that entry is. Yes. When I lost myself, November 29th through 30th, 2017. 
Is it fair to say this is a pretty long essay? Yes. Okay. And is uh, have you looked at the handwritten compared to the typed, and are they the same? Yes, I have. How many type pages are there in this essay? I guess I should ask you that first before we yes. go to it. There are 31 typed pages. Do you mean there are five type pages, number twice? Oh. <laughs> yes. Is that a mistake? I was reading the bottom number. Okay. Instead of counting, but there are five. Okay. Yes. I'm not going to go through this whole essay with you. Yes. Um, I just want to ask you one thing that's in the essay. Okay. On the second to last page, or page four of the type version of the essay, can you please read that? Yes. I do not mean to stay to say that he is irrational for not running away with me. Rather, I mean his hopes for a potential. I fail to understand his love for an abusive partner, at least in ways specifically understand the desire for stability. All the more so because of his friendships are mediated by this relationship. To give up his current partner is to risk losing his friends. Furthermore, I understand his feelings of guilt, guilty. This issue is my lack of sympathy. I do not see what there is to feel guilty about. He cannot do as he wants, and thus there is no love. If he did as he wanted, even without doing evil, the relationship would end. There is no love. Love is not happening, and yet he loves. I do not understand, but still I hope to be understanding. Did Alex Woodward discuss this journal entry with you? Yes. And that particular part which is referenced, what did he say to you about that? Well, when he was writing this very long journal, he pointed this out, that he had been writing about me, and I noticed that instead of saying as you might, she or her, he was saying my masculine pronoun, his, him. He was talking about kind of his desires for our relationship and how he desired for my other relationship to end. And I think, all right, I'll do that later. Was there a particular phrase that Alex, a philosophical phrase that Alex frequently used? Yes, he would often say to me, love and do as you will. And in your mind? Yes. What, in your mind, well, first let me ask you this. What did Alex say that that meant to him? He said to me, in what I took from what we talked about, that this love and do as you will was a way to say, I will do what I want, I will love who I want, I will do what I need to do in love. And that essentially is he will take what he wants. Okay. I'm showing you an essay about love and do what you will. What is it called? Delige et quad vis fact. Do you know what language that is? I believe it's French. Okay. Regardless of what language it is, because I don't know, um, do you know what it translates to? Love and do as you will. All right. What's the date that this essay was written? November 9th, 2017. By this time, and is it the same as the type handwritten version? Yes. All right. By this time, was your sexual relationship with Alex, um, 
had you had sexual intercourse by this time? Yes, we had had sexual intercourse by that time. Okay. And I'm not, again, I'm not going to ask you to read the whole essay. Yes. Um, but I'm going to ask specifically about this third paragraph and where it says, please forgive me. Okay. Can you read that part, That just those two sentences? Yes. Please forgive me for moving like you. You who are so alive. I profane the very breaths I take, an undead hoping to pass for something other than conscious, than a conscious corpse. My guilt is wanting love without having a heart. And the next sentence? I've half-heartedly tried to isolate myself from you, afraid I would taint you. Okay, and then on, I'm going to move down. One second. I'm going to move down to the end of the page. Okay, I'm off the screen. I'm sorry. Yes. I'm going to get it on the screen because when I look down, it looks like it's on the screen, but it's not. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yes, this last paragraph. Can you read that? Yes. I was further contaminated. This all mutated. I wanted to be happy but felt unworthy. I wanted to be loved but refused to believe it possible. I wanted to be alive but lacked a heart. And you hurt me. I hated myself through you, and you were a living death. Everything I said came to be a lie. I had to escape the monster I became with you. You did not deserve it, nor did I. Do you? Did Alex talk to you about what he's referring to when he says, I had to become the monster? I had to escape the monster I became with you? Yes. What is that? In this conversation, we discussed how he felt, how we were continuing our relationship sexually, intimately, how he f wearing the masks to everyone else. And what do you mean by masks? And you, you just explain that. Wearing the masks as to seem a certain way with everyone, let's say, out in public, but underneath the mask there was a lot hidden all right I'm going to ask you about one other line in this essay this is near the end of the essay yes and again we're not going to read the whole thing but I just would ask you to read the top sentence I am I am still afraid of myself, afraid I will come out again and hurt someone. Now, when he said that, did you discuss what he meant by he was afraid he would come out and hurt someone? Yes. Okay. And continuing with that paragraph? No, I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Nelson wants to say something. Why don't you tell the jury what he said to you about him saying he was afraid he would come out and hurt someone? What he said to me about this in our discussion is he said to me how he was afraid he was going to take all. He was going to be greedy in the sense that he was, if he wanted something, he was going to get what he wanted. I'm going to refer you back to an earlier part of the essay, more in the beginning, that I forgot to read you. Or yes. forgot to ask you to read. Yes. Um, so let me just make sure I have that on there. Where it says, I've half-heartedly. Yes. I've half-heartedly tried to isolate myself from you, afraid I would taint you, yet I love you. I am sorry for this failure on my part. I know my touch would kill you, yet I reach out. That is my sin, the violence of my flesh that I lack a soul to correct. Uh, okay. Now, did he discuss that with you specifically? Yes. What did he tell you about that? What he told me about this is that in our relationship, I expressed a lot of my anxieties and my uncertainties with my previous relationship, continuing relationship with Jason. He was expressing to me that 
He knew it was causing me anxiety to pursue this, to keep pursuing this relationship and what we were doing. And he told me that at this point it was that he didn't really necessarily care anymore, that he was causing this anxiety, that he was going to reach out anyways to me, that he was going to continue our relationship because that's what he wanted. Now, did there come a time where Alex cut his wrist? Yes. Um, can you tell the jury about that? There had been a time when I received some messages from Alex saying that he had harmed himself. I was, he was asking me if I could drive him to a pharmacy or to help him out with this. And Jason at the time was, he asked me about it and I told him Alex was hurt and Jason wanted to help. So I had gone over to Alex's house to help him and that is when I seen what had happened and Jason had patched him up as he said. When you say you saw what had happened, can you please describe that to the jury? What I saw had, had happened was he had slit his wrist and he shown me that he had to use a t-shirt to kind of stifle the bleeding. And it was just a very ugly gash from what I looked at. At a later date, did Alex tell you, first of all, at that time, when you were there with Jason, did he say, if you remember, yes. what he said about cutting his wrist? What he said to me about cutting his wrist is that he felt he was feeling depressed again and that he felt like he was feeling dead inside. Did he tell you that in front of Jason or did he tell you that at a later date? He told me that not in front of Jason, but kind of to the side. He pulled me to the side when we were talking. And again, I'm showing you another essay by Alex Woodworth from exhibit number 697. What is this essay called? This essay is called Between Two Hands, January 20th through 22nd, 2018. Is it the same as the handwritten version, the typed version? Yes. Is this in evidence? Yes. Already? Okay. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Exhibit 697, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. And again, I'm going to ask you to read a small portion of this larger essay. Um, and I would ask you just the second paragraph, can you read that? Yes. Should I confess that I have a large gas gash on my left wrist, a self-inflicted wound that had severed nerves and nearly cut through tendons? For me, one hand can only feel and move in a limp, numb way. Okay, what? I'm going to stop you. Did yes. he did he discuss this essay with you? Yes, definitely. Did he, did he literally mean that his left hand couldn't move anymore? He could move it. He just said it felt different. Okay. And is he referring in this essay, did he tell you that he was writing about the time where he had cut his wrist. Yes. And he specifically, what did he specifically later tell you about cutting his wrist? He told me he had done it kind of in a, a, a painful response to my rejection. Um, later on in this essay, after he says limp, numb way, can we just go to um, one, one where it hand. says one of my hands, yeah. We have one of my hands has quit its status almost as lib as corpse proper. It is no longer proper. It is a shameful and an advertising of my own lack of well-being. The reversibility of hands is gone. For me, <laughs> one hand cannot feel. It is inactive, but it cannot be felt either. It is unpassive. I love you. What? Does it say I love you, Ted? Yes, but... Do you know what Ted refers there's to? There's no Ted, no. Okay. Um, 